hardware and software. CPU, central processing unit. Now usually in every class I get up and I draw a picture of a CPU, not a real picture, you know, just a box, and how instructions are sent to it. And I've already done that like three times in the past two days. I don't have the stomach for doing it one more time. So we're going to skip that right now. But a CPU is just a piece of silicon with a whole bunch of transistors in it that manipulates numbers. Ultimately, it manipulates zeros and ones. And it reads those numbers in from memory, RAM, random access memory. And it changes numbers in RAM. And so all our computer programs will be doing will be manipulating ultimately numbers. Now we go, no, that doesn't make sense. Not everything is a number, you know. If we write my name is Joe, that's not numbers. Well, underneath it all, the computer thinks that they're numbers. Each letter is represented by a different number. Or if you're using a touch screen, you know, at coordinate 700 comma 350, the user touched this place with this amount of pressure. You know, that's a series of numbers. So every device has memory. The memory holds the programs and it holds the data. Random access memory means that it can be accessed in any order. It's not just like a paper tape where all the numbers are printed, you know, are punched in sequentially. Instead, the computer can get, you know, any number from any place that any address in its memory. Then there's secondary memory, storage. What's hard to tell now in these devices, our phones and our tablets and stuff, what is the difference between memory and, and storage? But it's a lot easier to tell on these computers. The RAM is the chip, you know, the memory chip. And then the storage is the CD drive or the uh, hard drive or the floppy drive or the SD card, you know, that we put in there with our pictures on it. Input devices are things that send data to the computer. Output devices are things that get data from the computer. Yeah, I don't have the stomach for telling you what a computer is. Let's see. Memory is volatile, meaning that main memory is erased when you turn the computer off. Now, people have played with trying to stop, you know, that, so that if you open up a machine and you spray the chip with Freon or something to freeze it, and, and then you pry it off and you can go and take the chip and analyze it and pull out some of the data. But whatever, it's volatile. Once you turn the computer off, your data is lost. That's why you need secondary storage, so that you can have your data stored on some kind of semi-permanent substance, so that it can then be loaded back in to be further modified. Because if you're processing census data, you would not have to, you would not want to enter five million, you know, 250 million records and then have the computer get turned off and you'd have to type them all in again. No, you would want that stuff written out to a database. So, data is organized in the following fashion. A bit is the smallest piece of memory. It has two values, zero or one. You know, a vacuum tube. If it wasn't glowing, it was a zero. If it was glowing, it was a one. If it was a mechanical relay, if the relay was open and no power was going through it, it was a zero. If the relay clicked close, then it was a one. You know, on the magnetic drives, you know, the hard drives or whatever, if the uh, hard drive is magnetized in a certain place, in a certain way, then that's a zero. Or if it's unmagnetized, it's a zero. If, ma if it's magnetized, it's a one, and so on. But really, in order for data to be more useful in terms of, you know, the way we think, we don't really want to think just about zeros and ones. A zero and a one by itself isn't very useful. It gets clustered together into what's known as a byte. Some clever person in the 60s or 50s or whatever decided that eight bits made a byte. And somebody else who was clever decided that a nibble was half a byte. Nobody talks about nibbles anymore. But just remember that. A byte is 8 bits. So a lot of times, whenever I bother coming up here and talking about binary, binary means zeros and ones, I may write down 8 because that is the minimum addressable cell in memory. Excuse me, that's a byte. And so if your computer has 2 gigabytes of RAM, it has 2 billion 
bytes of RAM. Then it's got, you know, each byte is composed of 8 bits. We will find out the largest number that a byte can hold when we start talking about binary. So main memory is addressable. The computer has a billion different places, and they're just numbered consecutively, just like addresses. You know, if, if you live in an apartment complex and you have mailbox 122, and mailbox 123, and mailbox 124, the computer has two billion different mailboxes, but each one can only hold eight bits. So in this figure, the number 149 is stored in the byte address 16. So we would count over 16, but computers start counting at zero. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And we find our number that's stored there, 149. And then the number 72 is stored at address 23. So we keep counting until we got to 23, and we find another byte, 23. Secondary storage is non-volatile, meaning that when the computer's turned off or everything is unplugged, that memory is still there. It still contains its value. So, you know, in something like a phone or whatever, there is RAM that gets reset when you power off your phone. That's why you're able to reboot your phone. But there is also non-volatile flash memory inside your phone that, uh, you know, maintains its power even when your phone is not turned on, which is a good thing because otherwise when your phone drained, you know, power and it shut itself off, you don't want to lose all your data on it. Magnetic media is the densest, typically, form of memory, which is why hard drives that are magnetic can contain such large amounts, terabytes of RAM. But that means that there's something spinning in there, and there are moving parts. And it's slower than purely electronic forms of devices, SD drives. You know, are starting to replace hard drives in, in laptops now, in your ultralight laptops, because they don't have spinning drives in them. Um, the RAM, the memory access is faster because it's not waiting that for that data to pass, you know, on that spinning platter under that little weed head. So they're faster, but they don't contain as much typically, you know, as hard drive space. Input devices, software programs. All right, we're going to talk about zeros and ones. We're going to talk about binary. By meaning two. There's two states, zero and one. Now, when we count, we typically count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But honestly, although there are ten digits, our digit, our counting system starts at zero, not one. So. In base 10, also known as decimal, deci meaning 10 to the Greeks or whatever, wherever we got that word, there are 10 digits starting with 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Binary is base 2. There's only two digits in it, 0 and 1. And I know that some of y'all have taken, like, 1113, in which case this will be a review, but, well, everybody has to, to get it. Not everybody has taken 1113. So to count in base 10, we do something like this. We start at 0, and I'm going to go ahead and put, like, three zeros there rather than one, because maybe we want to count up to a maximum of 999 before our odometer rolls over. So we add 1 to that. Now we're at 1. Now we're at 2. We keep adding 1 to it. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now we want to add 1 to it again. What happens? 9, that place, that column is maxed out. There's no digit larger than 9. So if we're going to add 1 to 9, what happens? What does that number become? Yeah, it becomes a zero. I was about to start glaring at Parisa because she sat through this lecture 15 minutes ago. <laughs> All righty, so that becomes a zero. And then the next column is incremented by one, just like on an odometer. 
zero, one, zero. And then you keep counting, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And by the time you get to 19, you know, that number is maxed out again. And you add one to that one. So after 19, it becomes 0, 2, 0, and so on. And that's intuitive to us. You know, we learned this when we were in first grade or kindergarten or whatever. And when you get to 0, 9, 9, and you want to add 1 to it, well, what does that column turn into? It's maxed out, so it gets reset back to a 0. And what happens? We carry that 1. It comes over here. Whoops, that one's maxed out too. So that one resets back to the lowest value possible. And we add one to there. Well, thank goodness that one's not maxed out, and we get 100. And so then when we're at 999 and we add one to it, it explodes. No, I'm kidding. But if three digits were all that we had, it would wrap back around to 000. zero, zero. Like if you had an odometer that had, you know, six places, you know, the largest number it could hold would be that. And then when you drove one more mile, you'd driven a million miles in your car. It would all be zeros again. So that's rollover. You know. Or you could call it another word. That's overrun, data overrun. It has exceeded the place it's, that's capable for. OK, so that's how you count in base 10. Now we're going to count in base 2. I'm going to cut this and paste this down here. All right, same thing except, yeah. Let's just do three zeros again. We add one to that, zero, zero, one. Now we're going to add another one to it. Can this number go up any higher? No, because we've already exceeded the maximum of our counting system. So this one gets reset back to a zero, and the one gets carried there. Then we're going to add one again. Well, you know, we haven't exceeded the limit there, so we can turn that into a one. And now we're going to add another one to it. Well, that one's at its max, the max that the counting system supports. So just like 99 rolls over to 100, well, this one rolls over to become a zero. We tack on, carry a one, but that one's maxed out, so it turns into a zero as well, and we carry the one there as well. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do the next four because of that's all it, that we can count. There we go. That's the next one. The ones place is maxed out, so we carry the one. I'm doing something wrong. No, that is correct. Okay. Now we have hit the maximum value that three bits can hold. And if we look, if we count in decimal and we put that number out beside it, that's a zero, that's a one, that's a two, that's a three, that's a four. That's a 5, that's a 6, and that's a 7. So there are 8 different values that can be expressed with 3 bits. If you have, whoopsie, excuse me. If you have 1 bit, you only have two, 2 possible states. If you have 2 bits, you have 4 possible states. When we count it with three bits, we had eight possible states. You can kind of see the pattern, right? Two, four, eight. Guess how many possible states you have with four bits? Yeah, you have 16 states. Five bits would be 32. Six bits would be 64. You had your Nintendo and your... And your you know, your old computers, they, only, they were 8-bit computers. They could only hold a certain number of states, you know, number of addressable pieces of RAM, so they, and a number of colors they could display on the screen. So they were much more limited than when you got to 16-bit computers, like the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo, which could display a lot more. Now, you don't have to just figure it out by, uh, well, let's just keep going. Let's see if we can figure out a relationship between this number and this number. I think that's pretty easy. This would be 2 to the power of 2. This would be 2 to the power of 3. This would be 2 to the power of 4. 
2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So an 8-bit Nintendo, the largest number that could be represented by it would be 2 to the power of 8, which is 256. If you had a 16-bit Genesis or Super Nintendo, these examples actually meant something to people at one time, but y'all probably all grew up playing Xbox and PlayStation. You have 16 bits, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 2 to the power of 16, 6, 5, 5, 3, 6. So your Genesis and your Super Nintendos could just pick from a much larger palette of colors and could address much larger amounts of memory than a Nintendo because the numbers that were supported by the number of bits in their system were larger. Then you had your PlayStations, which I don't know if there were 64 bits or whatever. But what is 2 to the power of 64? If you had a 64-bit chip, well, I can't calculate that, but I can tell Google to. 2 to the power of 64. All right, that's a huge number. That's obviously way more shades of color than the human eye could discern against. So, you know, once you got beyond 16-bit graphics, you could get photorealism. You could get enough colors that, that things, pictures actually look like pictures. 16 bits isn't enough to display something that actually looks like a photograph. But 24 or 32 bits is enough. 2 to the power of 32. No, that's the wrong symbol. 2 to the power of 32. There you go. Is that four, 400 million different shades, 4 billion different shades of colors? That, that, that's quite enough. So, you know, your earliest, earliest IBMs that ha had color cards that were 8-bit color cards, and they could display, you know, any of maybe 256 colors. And then you had 16-bit color cards. Then you had your 32-bit color cards, which could display photographs and stuff like that. Let's stop there with 8 bits going up to 256, 16 bits going up to there. Alrighty. Now, if I wanted to look at some data that was stored in RAM, I would really be annoyed if it looked like this and I, as a human, had to try to figure out what that was or memorize it. Under, underneath it all, this is what the computer sees. But when we want to display that on screen, we don't want to just display a whole bunch of zeros and ones. So there needs to be a way of breaking that up into some fashion that is more easily understandable. Well, we have a little chart up here where we could break it up into groups of three. So if we were going to try to work this out, we could say that a zero, zero, I'm going to put spaces between these to make them easier to figure out. There we go. So what's a zero, zero, zero? According to our chart down here, it's a zero. What's a zero, one, zero? Two. What's a one, one, oh? That's a six. That's a zero. That's a zero. Okay. This is kind of boring. What's an oh, one, oh? Two. What's a one, oh, one? Five, and so on. This is what's known as octal. There's eight different digits supported in this counting system. If you were counting an octal, you would count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then when you added 1 to it, you get 10. That's 8. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and then the next one would be 20. That's octal. At one time, that was a big deal. People thought, you know, that uh, breaking the bits up into threes was a good way of displaying data. That's not really the best way. Let's try breaking them up into clusters of four. Let's make a little table like this, but with four bits rather than three. I'm going to copy. 
copy this and paste this. Okay, good. So, whoops. Why don't I keep those? Just add another bit. And then copy these, but change the first bit to 1. All right, so counting them down, that's an 8. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So the largest value that could be stored in 4 bits is 15. And the number of values you have, including 0, is 16. And we'd already said that up there somewhere. 2 to the power of 4 is 16. So if we were going to break these up and to try to display the same data using that chart, it doesn't really work out very well. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's break them into clusters of four. Okay, so all zeros is a zero. What's 1011? Cheater. I haven't introduced hexadecimal yet. Yes, it's 11. That's 0. 0, 1. What's 0101? Let, let's sew in some things with 1s in the beginning of them. <laughs> okay, there. What is that? 1101. That's a 13. What's 1010? 10. What's 1011? 11. Okay, good enough. Now the problem with that is, is that if you just strung all these together, you wouldn't know whether this was 0 followed by a 1, followed by a 1, followed by a 0, or whether it was a 0 followed by an 11, or whether it was 0110, or whatever. So to accurately get that to work, you would actually need two digits to represent this data. Each cluster of four bits is represented by two bits. That way, if they were all strung together, you'd know, okay, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 13, 10, 11. But that's not too cool because more than half the time, you have all these wasted zeros. So what you can do is use something called hexadecimal. And that's what you were doing and yet you're staying awake. I'm impressed. Okay, so that is where instead of saying that 1010 is a 10, you say it's an A, and you say that's a B, and that's a C, that's a D, that's an E, and that's an F. Why is it called hexadecimal? Hex means six. We have 16 different digits now. We have zero through nine, that's 10 digits, plus six more. And if you're counting in hexadecimal, it works the same way. It wraps around. You're going 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But when you hit 9, that's not the largest that hexadecimal supports. A, B, C, D, E, and F. Now you've maxed it out. You can't get larger than F. So if you want to add 1 to it, then you get 10. And then as you start counting again, Etc. By the time you get to 1F and you want to add 1 to it, that one's maxed out, so it turns into a 0 and you get 2, 0, and so on. And if you had FF and you wanted to add 1 to it, well, that one's maxed out, so that one turns into a 0. That one's maxed out, so that one turns into a 0. And if you had space for an extra number, then that becomes 100. So hexadecimal just contains 16 different digits. Binaries, two digits. Decimals, 10 digits. Hexadecimal, 16 digits. So we're tacking on A, B, C, D, E, and F. All right, so now if we translate these clusters of four bits into numbers, we can do it a little bit better. That's still a 0. That's still a 1. Why did I say that was a 0, 1? That does not look like a 0, 1. That's still a 0. That's still 0. It's really, it's the first part of the data is pretty boring. What was I doing? No, 
How's it correct? We have one zero one one. You can got it marked as Oh you're right. I think you had another one there. I think I changed something and I confused myself. Okay, a one zero one one is a eleven here. Okay. Now it's starting to make it a little more sense. So a one zero one one in hex is a B. Then we have all zeros, we have all zeros, we have a one. And then we have one one oh one, which if we look that up, that's a thirteen. A thirteen is a D. A ten is an A. Eleven is a B again. And then if we had all ones, let's make one that's all ones just to sum things up here at the end. All ones is a fifteen. What's a fifteen? It's an F. Now we can you know, remove all the spaces from it, like that, and it actually makes, you know, so whereas before, when we were just using decimal to try to represent the data, you know, it took a lot more space on the screen to display it. So this is the decimal equivalent here of that series of zeros and ones, and this is the hexadecimal equivalent. And that's still comprehensible. You know, you could come up with some system that didn't only have 16 digits, it had 32 digits. How would you do that? You would use letters larger than F. You know, you'd go all the way out to X or something like that. But this is a nice way of breaking it out. So you'll see hex used a lot in a lot of different places. All righty. We're going to rewind a little bit. How do I know that 1011 is a whatever I said it was? Well, if I didn't have that chart memorized, I can still figure out what this is, not just by counting, but by places. And what do I mean by that? If you have the number 309 in base 10, This really means 3 times 100 plus 0 times 10 plus 9 times 1. And then if you add these up, you get, you know, 300 plus 0 plus 9. So that's equal to 309. Yeah, we made a round trip back to that. But, that, but that's, that's what the different things mean. This is the ones column, the ones place. This is the tens place. This is one, the one hundredths place. So really, one hundred is ten to the power of two. And ten is ten to the power of one. And one is ten to the power of zero. It's kind of a little mathematical problem. There's a proof for why any number to the power of zero is one. So if you have this, 490, what does that mean? Or 590, that means five times 10 to the power of two plus nine times 10 to the power of what? Plus zero times 10 to the power of what? Yeah, which is 500 plus 90 plus 0 gets us our round trip back to 590. Now, why am I doing that? We already understand our base 10. But base 2 works the same way. If you have 4 bits, this places the 1's column again. But binary does powers of 2. So that column is 2 to the power of 0. And then this column here is 2 to the power of 1. 2 to the power of 1 is what? It's 2. And this column is 2 to the power of 2. What's 2 to the power of 2? What's 2 squared? 4. And so this next column is 2 to the power of 8. Nope, nope, where did that 8 come from? I have no idea. Sorry, short circuit. 2 to the power of 3. 
Well, we see the pattern here. It's doubling each time. One, two, four, eight. There we go. So this number I, I threw at myself a little while ago. What is 1011 equal to in decimal? When I put a parentheses in 2, that means it's in binary or base 2. And I'm going to say, what is 1011 in base 2 in base 10? Okay. Well, we have 8, 4, 2, 1. 1011. How many 8s do we have? We have 1, 8. So this is equal to 8. 1 times 8. Plus, how many 4s do we have? We have no zero uh, fours. Plus, how many twos do we have? We see where these are coming from, right? One times two plus how many ones do we have? One. Okay. And then if we add these up, eight plus two is ten plus one. That's equal to eleven. Let's do one more. One. One o. Oh. Okay, we're going to do the same thing. Adding them up in your head, what is that, this 1101 equal to? It's equal to 8 plus 4, which is 12, no 2s, and 1 1, so it's equal to 13. All right, guys, go out to the Dropbox. Not the Dropbox. I'm so sorry. We won't make a Dropbox for it. But uh, go out to Content in our D2L. And there's just a little worksheet that we're going to fill out as we go along. Look under Notes, Unit 1 Notes. We'll see something that says Binary and Hex. Download that and open it. So scroll down to the bottom till you find your download button. Save it and open it, whatever means necessary. You know, save it to your desktop or whatever. If you can't find your downloads and you're using Chrome, you look under the little menu here and you see downloads and you can open them that way. Everybody knows how to download files. Okay, so homework, part A. Convert from binary to decimal. We're going to do the same thing that I was just demoing up here. 1011 means 8, or 1 times 8, plus, no 4s, plus 2, plus 1 is equal to 11. Do the same thing for the next 4. Just write it out like that. Don't just put the answer. Don't go put, oh, that's 6, and, you know, that's 15. Actually write all the components out. So this one is 4 plus 2 is equal to 6. And programming gets more interesting than this math that we're doing right now. But you'll run into this math again as a professional programmer, the idea of bits and of hexadecimal. You really just have to kind of tuck it away into the back of your head. And then when we talk about why some numbers are 16-bit and why some numbers are 64 bits and why those are so much larger, why they can contain much larger values, you'll understand you know, why that is. did put the answers up here, but hopefully you'd already had had them worked out. For part B, it's easier if you have a little binary to uh, to hex chart, and we made one of those up here. Remember that? We typed in all these numbers, 
this column was binary, this column was base 10, and this column was 16, hex. I'm just going to tuck this over here on my screen so that you can do the homework. I'm going to slam this to the side to dock it, and here we go. So if all zeros is a zero, then what's 0, 1, 1, 0? Well, if we look it up, 0, 1, 1, 0 is a 6. So I can put a 6 there. And what's 1, 1, 1, 0? Oh? Yeah, that's an E, so I'm going to fill that in with an E. And what's 0, 1, 0, 1? That's a 5. Now let's do the reverse. Let's take these numbers and turn them into bits. And A, as already done before us, is 1010. Zero, one, zero. That means that a B is a 1011. Zero, one, one. So what's a D? A D is a 1101. What's a 7? Yeah. And an 8? What's an F? All are lit up. Yep. All right. Okay, we have done that worksheet. The rest of this document is a prettier explanation of what I'd already talked about. How to count in base 2, how to count in base 10. So the powers of 2. 2 to the 0 is a 1. 2 to the 1 is a 2. 2 to the 2 is a 4. 2 to the 3 is an 8. Whereas in powers of 10, 10 to the 1. 10 to the 0 is a 1. 10 to the 1 is a 10. 10 to the 2 is 100, 10 to the 3 is 1,000. These are kind of cool because you can just use that number there as the number of zeros. So if you have to write down 10 to the power of 8, you know it's a 1 followed by 8 zeros. Counting in binary, 0, 1, 10, 11, 100, 101, 110, 111. So there's a joke, and everybody is supposed to laugh uproariously at this one. There are... I've seen this on shirts. Okay, there are 10 kinds of people in the world, those who understand binary and those who don't. So what's the joke there? If you know binary, you know what that is. What is that actually in binary? It's two, because you have a, a one in the two's place and nothing in a one place. So I want to hear some laughs. Thank you, thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> thank you. All righty, I'm satisfied. Okay, converting from binary to decimal. That's the 8's place, the 4's place, the 2's place, and the 1. So if you're going to convert 1, 0, 1, 0, you would add up 8 and 2 and get 10. Here's a cute little base 10, 16, and 2 chart. If I ask you to do any of this stuff on an exam, which I will do on the first test, I will give this to you so that you don't then have to sit there and try to figure it out. You know. So it'll be as easy as this worksheet was, you know, when you had the table there to do the comparisons. Converting from base 2 to base 16 using this chart. Yeah, yeah, we've already done all this. This is the entire lecture in a prettier form. So why didn't you just use those? Because I think that it's e actually easier to process and understand when you see the stuff being typed out. Alright, 
we have a little bit more time and I've hit the end of talking about zeros and ones and binary and hexadecimal as far as this is concerned. So we're going to talk about and and or and not. Now before there were computing languages where you use the words and and or, there was electrical engineering. And I honestly never remember which is which. Okay, the and is the bullet shaped one and the or is the Star Trek chevron symbol shaped one. Okay, so of computer programming, you do things like this. If A is greater than zero and B is equal to three. Both of these things have to be true before whatever statement is inside the braces here. You know, print I. So let's give it some input. Let's say that A is equal to 10 and B is equal to 5. So we're going to come over here. If A is greater than 0 and B is equal to 3. Well, is A greater than 0? It is because it's 10, so that's good. Is B equal to 3? No, it is not. So that's not good. And this is an AND. And both sides have to be true before the AND is satisfied. So it's not going to print high. That's the AND logic. And this is what's known as the AND truth table. If you wanted to replace the zeros with Fs for false, and you wanted to replace the ones with Ts for true, then you get logic rather than binary. But it's the same thing. If you go and take a, a, a logic class someday, then uh, you'll get real tired of doing this. So an OR gate looks a little bit different. An electronics, they draw it with a sharp little pointy nose. Like that. And if you're doing ORs, then only one of these has to be on before the output is on. If A is switched on, the light begins to glow. And if you switch A off but you switch B on, the light still glows. So either one of them can be on, and you'll get some output. All right, what are our four states again, my four numbers? Just read them off at the top. First one is zero, zero. What comes after zero, zero? What's next? And lastly, one, one. Now, for an OR 
OR gate, either one, either A or B, can be on and the output will be on. So is it on or off for this top one? It's on. It's off. But for the rest of them, it's on. <laughs> Notice that there's some kind of parallelism here, where there's only one on state for an AND, and there's only one off state. Or. And then there's one more thing called not. Not is represented in electronics, I think, with just a little circle. And what that means is it flips it. If you have A coming in and it hits a not, not a not like a string, then it reverses it. If A is lit, then the light bulb goes off. If A is turned off, then the light bulb turns on. So the not truth table is even shorter. It's only got two states. I pity the people who missed today because the recorder does not record the screen. If it's not false, it's true. If it's not true, it's false. And you could do that for each of these. You could replace all the zeros with falses and all the ones with t's and you'd have a truth table. So these are our truth tables. We'll hit them again at some point. I'll bring them back up again so that we'll have them on screen. In terms of electrical engineering, not only are there AND gates and OR gates, there are NAND gates, which means not AND, and there are NOR gates, which means not OR. If it's a NAND gate, it means you just take the output and you flip it. Like that. No, I botched that one. So the only time a NAND gate is off is when both inputs are on. And in a NOR gate, you just take the OR logic, but you flip the output. They draw a NAND gate, like the little bullet, but it's got a little dot coming out of it. And they draw the NOR, the NOR gate as that chevron looking thing, but it's got a dot in a circle. And so the NOR versions of this is the OR table, but reversed. So you have one, two, three, like that. Things like flash memory and stuff like that is composed, if I'm not mistaken, of billions of NAND gates on a chip. And I don't know why they choose NAND over everything else. If you ever hear NAND, that's what it means. It's just an AND truth table, but with the output flipped. So if it's zero, it was one, one and zero. Are we are there NAND and NOR statements in C? No, there are not, to my knowledge. There is something called exclusive OR. Exclusive OR means that the output is on. If A is on or if B is on, but not if both are on. And honestly, I don't know the symbol for exclusive OR. I guess I could Google it, huh? Oh, it's a chevron with an extra line on it. What do you know? So if A is on, then the output is on. If B is on, the output is on. But if both A and B are on, the output switches back off. And if neither one of these are on, then the output switches back off. 
So here's the exclusive or truth table. So for exclusive or, the rules are either one side or the other has to be on for the output to, to be on, but they can't both be on. So is this on or off? Zero, zero. That's off. How about zero, one? That's on. How about one, zero? On. And what about one, one? Off. Because exclusive or means exclusively either one or the other, but not both. Is there a keyword in C++ that means exclusive or? No, but there's a symbol. If you're doing um, bit manipulations, you can do and, ors, and exclusive ors. So in C++, when we're writing an if statement, and we want to use and and or, well, in the Python programming language, you just use the word and. Like if you want to do if a greater than 10 and b equals 3, that's a valid Python statement, although you have to end it with that. But if you're going to do it in C, or Java, or any number of other languages that have stolen C syntax, C++, you do it like this. A greater than 10 and, that's called the and sign. When I say and, I want you to hit two ampersands, which is shift 7. Now, in order to make this valid C, unlike Python, and I'm mentioning this because several of y'all have had my Python class, you have to include enclose the expression in parentheses. So in C, excuse me, in Python, you do not enclose your expression in parentheses, although it wouldn't fail if you did. In C, in C++, you have to. In Python, if you were going to do something like that, you just indent it. You don't use any symbols. In C and in Java languages like that, you use curly braces. And you really don't use the word help print. We would do this. Like that. So, and is two ampersands. What about or? Or is two vertical bars. Shift backslash. Look on your keyboard above the inner key. If you want to type an or, you hit shift backslash backslash. You need to get the two vertical bars. So if you want to write an expression that looks like this, if temperature is greater than 97, wait, temperature is greater than 32 and temperature less than 212, then the water is liquid. Print liquid. That's Python. That works. But, excuse me, I'm botching this one. I will rewrite it. I mean, I will restate it as soon as I type it up here. Okay. So, if the temperature of something is less than 32, it's frozen. If the temperature is greater than 212, it's boiling. So if the temperature is less than 32 or the temperature is greater than 212, we know that the water is not a liquid. That's how we would do it in Python. In C, we would use those vertical bars. And in C, our expression has to be include, enclosed in parentheses. So we do if temperature less than 32 or temperature greater than 212, we do that, print, nope. Don't use print. C out. Not liquid. And if I want to be fancy and use that E and D L rather than a backslash, in, then there we go. All righty. So I think we just hit chapter four. Let's address one more thing which I mentioned very briefly on Tuesday, which is that line that said using namespace std. Our program looks something like this. Pound sign include IO stream. Then I had using namespace std. And then I had int main like that. 
and then it said C out hello world and line like that. If we didn't have this here, if that was commented out, anything with double slashes means that it's just a comment, it's no longer part of the code. If we do that, the program would give us a syntax error. It would no longer know what C out and ENDL are. And the reason for those is, is that is they are defined as part of a namespace STD. So to tell the program where they came from, we'd have to do that. We have to preface those with STD. That's kind of like if you have some several namespaces in Oklahoma. You have a namespace called Midwest City, and then you have a namespace called Stillwater. If we do this, using namespace Stillwater, then we can refer to Eskimo Joe's. We can refer to OSU. If we did not have that line there, then we would have to say Stillwater colon Eskimo Joe's. Because there might be an Eskimo Joe's somewhere else. Stillwater colon colon OSU. And there certainly are other OSUs like Ohio State University. Similarly, what are some uh, landmarks in Midwest City? In Midwest City, in the Midwest City namespace, we have, I don't know, we have Rose and we have Tinker. Whoopsie, come back here. So in the Midwest City namespace, we have Tinker and we have Rose. And in the Stillwater namespace, we had OSU and we had Eskimo Joe's. So in order to reference Midwest City, we either have to do this, Midwest City, no, wait, excuse me, if we want to reference Tinker, we either have to do this, Midwest City colon colon Tinker, Midwest City colon colon Rose, but if we did this using namespace Midwest City, then we could just refer to Tinker and we could refer to Rose because we would know that we're already talking about Midwest City. We don't have to be more specific. I don't know if that's a good example or not. Just remember, pardon? So that's just the uh, using namespace standard. That's just the way of importing the class? It doesn't import the class. The, the import was actually done by the pound sign include. But all the stuff that's in IO Stream is separated into different namespaces. There are several different namespaces inside IO Stream. One of them being STD. And STD has our C outs and our C ins and our e ENDLs. So if we tack this on, if we do it using namespace STD, we don't have to get so specific with these keywords. We can just do that, and we can just do that. So the hashtag include IO Stream, that's saying inside that class I'm going to use this. Exactly. Okay. Think library though not class. You sound like a I Java programmer. Have you done Java? Yeah. Okay. In Java every file is its own class. In C++ you can throw a whole bunch of classes into the same file if you okay. want to. So a single library could contain any number of classes. Okay. I'm just saying that because I can tell you're a Java programmer and that's a different way of thinking. But you're right, it looks like class definitions. Class followed by the variable name. But instead it's namespace. Pardon me? That was the way I was breaking it down. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Slightly different, but same thing. When we do classes in C++, that will apply directly. You know, you'll have the class name followed by the variable name. It's just it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence by necessity. It's good programming to put each class in its own file. All right, I think we've chattered enough. Are there any questions? I'd like for y'all to go ahead and read chapter one. Just go ahead and read it by Tuesday, but there's not gonna be a quiz on it. And if I say that, y'all aren't gonna read it. Please read it. <laughs> you bought a, the book, it was a lot of money. You may as well get some knowledge out of it, but you saw what kind of stuff it was.
was. What is a computer? What is an input device? What is an output device? And that way I don't have to lecture anymore on that kind of stuff. And we won't exam on that stuff, but it's, it's stuff that you need to have percolating in your brain. But it's, it's not worth putting off programming. So next week we'll actually do programming. All right, since we filled out that worksheet, we may as well make a Dropbox for it so we all get credit for it. It's there, so if you refresh your Dropbox, you'll see it there. Just go ahead and upload your Word doc. And so you won't really totally be bored. I'd like for y'all to go ahead and get your DreamSpark account registered and to try to download Microsoft Visual Studio. get the 2013 version if you want to match exactly what's on the computers here. And I'd recommend that just so that if you create a project at home, you can bring that project here and open it without any incompatibilities. I will write up stronger instructions for that. Um, if you are not going to install DreamSpark at home, if you have a Mac and you're already using Xcode or you're using uh, you know, some kind of a new compiler on your Linux machine, or you just don't feel like installing Visual Studio on your machine at home, instead upload a document that says I'm going to do my homework, you know, at school, or I'm going to do it on my Mac, or whatever. Just let me know that you've made a conscious decision about how you're going to do your homework, because really those are your only choices. You either have a C++ compiler available to you, and your Windows users will want to get C um, Visual Studio, or you're going to do your work here. We'll make that do by in a week from now. But really, if you can't get it installed now, it's, I'm not going to count off if you don't get it, you know, done this weekend. But I, I'd like for you all to hurry up and do it so that as homework comes along, then you'll be able to work on it. I'll post a video about accessing DreamSpark. And I'll send email about it. So, and heck, there are so few people who are attending this class, I could send a text out about it as well. So, uh, but, yeah. DreamSpark is the only licensing thing Rosa uses for software. I think that I would, I don't know of any others. I guess a better question is there's no way to get Windows 10 Pro either. Check DreamSpark and see what versions of Windows they have there. Is that apparently an education version? Probably not Pro. Probably not. I would agree with you there. Yeah. So anyways, the way you access DreamSpark, you don't have to wait for a video, is you go to DreamSpark.com, and the instructions for accessing it are posted on the home page down here, free software. You log in with your student rate or email address as your username. So I'm going to load up DreamSpark. Didn't I do that? Here we go. I want to log in. Oh, it's rose.dreamspark.com. Am I forgetting something? OK, let me look at my instructions one more time. DreamSpark.rose.edu. There we go. I follow that. It takes me to a special configured version of DreamSpark. I need to register for an account. You click register if you've never done this before. It needs a username. I'm going to enter my email address, my Raider email address. Yours is first name dash last name, Rebecca Penley or whatever. Raider dot, at raider.rose.edu. And your organization is Rose State. You click continue. It says no matching account was found for the identifier entered. Please ensure for further assistance, please request an account. 
Yours may already be set up. Hopefully it is. Oh, mine? Anybody's. If not, do that thing where you say request an account. Pardon? Mine is. Okay, good. So students should already have an account set up. And if not, then the turnaround on that is pretty quick. Arlene Hayes jumps on those and gets them for you. So you can grab Visual Studio, and try to install it. And like I said, tomorrow I'll record a video on doing so. But don't be afraid. Just go ahead and try it anyways. You become a stronger person by banging your head on the keyboard. So without having your hand held, the more things you try to do without having your hand held, the better, uh, better computer user you are. Enough lecturing. I'll see you all on Tuesday.